The Life Divine by Sheryl Bindo. Chapter 6 Man in the Universe The soul of man, a traveler, wanders in this cycle of Brahman, huge, a totality of lives, a totality of states, thinking itself different from the impeller of the journey, accepted by him, it attains its goal of immortality. Svetasvatara Upanishad The progressive revelation of a great, a transcendent, a luminous reality with the multitudinous relativities of this world that we see and those other worlds that we do not see as means and material, condition and feel. This would seem, then, to be the meaning of the universe. Since meaning and aim it has, and is neither a purposeless illusion nor a fortuitous accident. For the same reasoning which leads us to conclude that world existence is not a deceptive trick of mind, justifies equally the certainty that it is no blindly and helplessly self-existent mass of separate phenomenal existences clinging together and struggling together as best they can in their orbit through eternity. No tremendous self-creation and self-impulsion of an ignorant force without any secret intelligence within aware of its starting point and its goal and guiding its process and its motion. An existence wholly self-aware and therefore entirely master of itself possesses the phenomenal being in which it is involved, realizes itself in form, unfolds itself in the individual. That luminous emergence is the dawn which the Aryan forefathers worshipped. Its fulfilled perfection is that highest step of the world pervading Vishnu, which they beheld as if an eye of vision extended in the purest heavens of the mind. For it exists already as an all-revealing and all-guiding truth of things, which watches over the world and attracts mortal man, first without the knowledge of his conscious mind, by the general march of nature, but at last, consciously, by a progressive awakening and self-enlargement to his divine ascension. The ascent to the divine life 
is the human journey, the work of works, the acceptable sacrifice. This alone is man's real business in the world and the justification of his existence, without which he would be only an insect crawling among other ephemeral insects on a speck of surface mud and water which has managed to form itself amid the appalling immensities of the physical universe. This truth of things that has to emerge out of the phenomenal world's contradictions is declared to be an infinite bliss and self-conscious existence. The same everywhere, in all things, in all times, and beyond time and aware of itself behind all these phenomena by whose intensest vibrations of activity or by whose largest totality it can never be entirely expressed or in any way limited, for it is self-existent and does not depend for its being upon its manifestations. They represent it, but do not exhaust it, point to it, but do not reveal it. It is revealed only to itself within their form. The conscious existence involved in the form comes as it evolves to know itself by intuition, by self-vision, by self-experience. It becomes itself in the world by knowing itself. It knows itself by becoming itself. Thus possessed of itself inwardly, it imparts also to its forms and modes the conscious delight of Satchitananda. This becoming of the infinite bliss, existence, consciousness in mind and life and body. For independent of them it exists eternally. Is the transfiguration intended and the utility of individual existence. Through the individual, it manifests in relation, even as of itself it exists in identity. The unknowable, knowing itself as Satchitananda, is the one supreme affirmation of Vedanta. It contains all the others, or on it they depend. This is the one veritable experience that remains when all appearances have been accounted for negatively by the elimination of their shapes and coverings, or positively by the reduction of their names and forms to the constant truth that they contain. 
for fulfillment of life or for transcendence of life. And whether purity, calm and freedom in the spirit be our aim, or puissance, joy and perfection, Satchitananda is the unknown, omnipresent, indispensable term for which the human consciousness, whether in knowledge and sentiment or in sensation and action, is eternally seeking. The universe and the individual are the two essential appearances into which the unknowable descends and through which it has to be approached. For other intermediate collectivities are born only of their interaction. This descent of the supreme reality is in its nature a self-concealing. And in the descent there are successive levels. In the concealing, successive veils. Necessarily, the revelation takes the form of an ascent and necessarily also the ascent and the revelation are both progressive. For each successive level in the descent of the divine is to man a stage in an ascension. Each veil that hides the unknown God becomes for the God-lover and God-seeker an instrument of his unveiling. Out of the rhythmic slumber of material nature, unconscious of the soul and the idea that maintain the ordered activities of her energy, even in her dumb and mighty material trance. The world struggles into the more quick, varied and disordered rhythm of life laboring on the verges of self-consciousness. Out of life it struggles upward into mind in which the unit becomes awake to itself and its world. And in that awakening, the universe gains the leverage it required for its supreme work. It gains self-conscious individuality. But mind takes up the work to continue, not to complete it. It is a laborer of acute but limited intelligence, who takes the confused materials offered by life, and having improved, adapted, varied, classified according to its power, hands them over to the supreme artist of our divine manhood. That artist dwells in supermind, for supermind is superman. Therefore our world has yet to climb beyond mind to a higher principle, a higher status, a higher dynamism, in which universe and individual become aware of and possess that which they both are.
and therefore stand explained to each other, in harmony with each other, unified. The disorders of life and mind cease by discerning the secret of a more perfect order than the physical. Matter below life and mind contains in itself the balance between a perfect poise of tranquility and the action of an immeasurable energy, but does not possess that which it contains. Its peace wears the dull mask of an obscure inertia, a sleep of unconsciousness, or rather of a drugged and imprisoned consciousness. Driven by a force which is its real self, but whose sense it cannot yet seize nor share, it has not the awakened joy of its own harmonious energies. Life and mind awaken to the sense of this want in the form of a striving and seeking ignorance and a troubled and baffled desire which are the first steps towards self-knowledge and self-fulfillment. But where then is the kingdom of their self-fulfilling? It comes to them by the exceeding of themselves. Beyond life and mind, we recover consciously in its divine truth that which the balance of material nature grossly represented, a tranquility which is neither inertia nor a sealed trance of consciousness, but the concentration of an absolute force and an absolute self-awareness and an action of immeasurable energy, which is at the same time an out-thrilling of ineffable bliss because its every act is the expression not of a want and an ignorant straining, but of an absolute peace and self-mastery. In that attainment, our ignorance realizes the light of which it was a darkened or a partial reflection. Our desires cease in the plenitude and fulfillment towards which, even in their most brute material forms, they were an obscure and fallen aspiration. The universe and the individual are necessary to each other in their ascent. Always indeed they exist for each other and profit by each other. Universe is a diffusion of the divine all in infinite space and time. The individual, its concentration within limits of space and time. 
universe seeks in infinite extension the divine totality it feels itself to be but cannot entirely realize. For in extension, existence drives at a pluralistic sum of itself, which can neither be the primal nor the final unit, but only a recurring decimal without end or beginning. Therefore, it creates in itself a self-conscious concentration of the all through which it can aspire. In the conscious individual, Prakriti turns back to perceive Purusha, world seeks after self. God having entirely become nature, nature seeks to become progressively God. On the other hand, it is by means of the universe that the individual is impelled to realize himself. Not only is it his foundation, his means, his field, the stuff of the divine work, but also, since the concentration of the universal life which he is takes place within limits and is not like the intensive unity of Brahman free from all conception of bound and turn, he must necessarily universalize and impersonalize himself in order to manifest the divine all which is his reality. Yet is he called upon to preserve even when he most extends himself in universality of consciousness, a mysterious transcendent something of which his sense of personality gives him an obscure and egoistic representation. Otherwise, he has missed his goal. The problem set to him has not been solved. The divine work for which he accepted birth has not been done. The universe comes to the individual as life, a dynamism, the entire secret of which he has to master and a mass of colliding results, a whirl of potential energies, out of which he has to disengage some supreme order and some yet unrealized harmony. This is, after all, the real sense of man's progress. It is not merely a restatement in slightly different terms of what physical nature has already accomplished. Nor can the ideal of human life be simply the animal repeated on a higher scale of mentality. Otherwise, any system or order which assured a tolerable well-being and a moderate mental satisfaction would have stayed our advance. The animal is satisfied with a modicum of necessity. The gods are content with their splendors. 
But man cannot rest permanently until he reaches some highest good. He is the greatest of living beings because he is the most discontented, because he feels most the pressure of limitations. He alone, perhaps, is capable of being seized by the divine frenzy for a remote ideal. To the life spirit, therefore, the individual in whom its potentialities center is preeminently man, the Purusha. It is the son of man who is supremely capable of incarnating God. This man is the Manu, the thinker, the Manomaya Purusha, mental person or soul in mind of the ancient sages. No mere superior mammal is he, but a conceptive soul basing itself on the animal body in matter. He is conscious name or numen, accepting and utilizing form as a medium through which person can deal with substance. The animal life emerging out of matter is only the inferior term of his existence. The life of thought, feeling, will, conscious impulsion, that which we name in its totality mind, that which strives to seize upon matter and its vital energies and subject them to the law of its own progressive transformation, is the middle term in which he takes his effectual station. But there is equally a supreme term which mind in man searches after, so that having found, he may affirm it in his mental and bodily existence. This practical affirmation of something essentially superior to his present self is the basis of the divine life in the human being. Awakened to a profounder self-knowledge than his first mental idea of himself, man begins to conceive some formula and to perceive some appearance of the thing that he has to affirm. But it appears to him as if poised between two negations of itself. If beyond his present attainment he perceives or is touched by the power, light, bliss of a self-conscious infinite existence and translates his thought or his experience of it into terms convenient for his mentality, infinity, omniscience, omnipotence, immortality, freedom, love, beatitude, God. Yet does this sun of his seeing appear to shine between a double night, 
a darkness below, a mightier darkness beyond. For when he strives to know it utterly, it seems to pass into something which neither any one of these terms nor the sum of them can at all represent. His mind at last negates God for a beyond, or at least it seems to find God transcending himself, denying himself to the conception. Here also, in the world, in himself and around himself, he is met always by the opposites of his affirmation. Death is ever with him. Limitation invests his being and his experience. Error, inconscience, weakness, inertia, grief, pain, evil, are constant oppressors of his effort. Here also he is driven to deny God, or at least the divine seems to negate or to hide itself in some appearance or outcome which is other than its true and eternal reality. And the terms of this denial are not like that other and remoter negation inconceivable and therefore naturally mysterious, unknowable to his mind, but appear to be knowable, known, definite, and still mysterious. He knows not what they are, why they exist, how they came into being. He sees their processes as they affect and appear to him. He cannot fathom their essential reality. Perhaps they are unfathomable. Perhaps they also are really unknowable in their essence. Or it may be they have no essential reality, are an illusion, are self, non-being. The superior negation appears to us sometimes as a nihil, a non-existence. This inferior negation may also be, in its essence, a nihil, a non-existence. But as we have already put away from us this evasion of the difficulty with regard to that higher so also we discard it for this inferior asat. To deny entirely its reality, or to seek an escape from it as a mere disastrous illusion, is to put away from us the problem and to shun our work. For life, these things that seem to deny God to be the opposites of Satchitananda are real, even if they turn out to be temporary. They and their opposites, good, knowledge, joy, pleasure, life, survival, strength, Power, increase, are the very material of her workings. 
it is probable indeed that they are the result or rather the inseparable accompaniments not of an illusion but of a wrong relation wrong because it is founded on a false view of what the individual is in the universe and therefore a false attitude both towards God and nature towards self and environment because that which he has become is out of harmony both with what the world of his habitation is and what he himself should be and is to be therefore man is subject to these contradictions of the secret truth of things in that case they are not the punishment of a fall but the conditions of a progress they are the first elements of the work he has to fulfill the price he has to pay for the crown which he hopes to win the narrow way by which nature escapes out of matter into consciousness they are at once her ransom and her stock for out of these false relations and by their aid the true have to be found by the ignorance we have to cross over death so too the veda speaks cryptically of energies that are like women evil in impulse wandering from the path doing hurt to their lord which yet though themselves false and unhappy build up in the end this vast truth the truth that is the bliss it would be then not when he has excised the evil in nature out of himself by an act of moral surgery or parted with life by an abhorrent recoil but when he has turned death into a more perfect life lifted the small things of the human limitation into the great things of the divine vastness transform suffering into beatitude converted evil into its proper good translated error and falsehood into their secret truth that the sacrifice will be accomplished the journey done and heaven and earth equalized join hands in the bliss of the supreme yet how can such contraries pass into each other by what alchemy shall this lead of mortality be turned into that gold of divine being but if they are not in their essence contraries if they are manifestations of one reality identical in substance then indeed a divine transmutation becomes conceivable we have seen 
that the non-being beyond may well be an inconceivable existence and perhaps an ineffable bliss. At least the nirvana of Buddhism which formulated one most luminous effort of man to reach and to rest in this highest non-existence represents itself in the psychology of the liberated yet upon earth as an unspeakable peace and gladness. Its practical effect is the extinction of all suffering through the disappearance of all egoistic idea or sensation. And the nearest we can get to a positive conception of it is that it is some inexpressible beatitude if the name or any name can be applied to a peace so void of contents, into which even the notion of self-existence seems to be swallowed up and disappear. It is a Satchidananda to which we dare no longer apply even the supreme terms of Sat, of Chit, and of Ananda. For all terms are annulled, and all cognitive experience is overpassed. On the other hand, we have hazarded the suggestion that since all is one reality, this inferior negation also, this other contradiction or non-existence of Satchidananda is none other than Satchidananda itself. It is capable of being conceived by the intellect perceived in the vision, even received through the sensations as verily that which it seems to deny. And such would it always be to our conscious experience if things were not falsified by some great fundamental error, some possessing and compelling ignorance, maya, or avidya. In this sense, a solution might be sought. Not perhaps a satisfying metaphysical solution for the logical mind, for we are standing on the borderline of the unknowable, the ineffable, and straining our eyes beyond. But a sufficient basis in experience for the practice of the divine life. To do this, we must dare to go below the clear surfaces of things on which the mind loves to dwell to tempt the vast and obscure, to penetrate the unfathomable depths of consciousness and identify ourselves with states of being that are not our own. Human language is a poor help in such a search but at least we may find in it some symbols and figures, return with some just expressible hints, which will help the light of the soul 
and throw upon the mind some reflection of the ineffable design.